Hello and welcome to this edition of Middle East Matters coming up in this week's show. Summer is synonymous with holidays for much of the world, but in the Gulf states, the season means suffering for millions of migrant laborers. On paper, the states banned them from working outside during the hottest hours. But a report from NGO Fair Square estimates that nonetheless, thousands of workers die every year. We'll speak to the group's director, Nicholas McGeehan, in just a few minutes. And Gazans get back on their surfboards thanks to a German-funded wastewater treatment plant. Marine pollution in the Mediterranean Sea no longer poses a risk to the enclave's 2.3 million residents. But first, every year, some 10,000 low-paid migrant labourers return home to Southeast Asia from the Gulf in body bags. Half these deaths are unexplained, and with no labour laws in place, nor any will from home nations to investigate, the cycle of exploitation continues unabated. Well, these figures are estimates published in a report from NGO Fair Square, based on available evidence. Well, as we enter the summer season, more and more of these vulnerable workers are succumbing to heat-related illnesses. France 24's Catherine Viette has the details. As a blazing sun beats down, extreme heat is becoming the norm in the Gulf region. On the first day of summer, temperatures hit 50 degrees Celsius in many places, including Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And that's a major concern for the millions of migrant laborers who toil outdoors. The region relies on workers from Southeast Asia who provide cheap labor and fill jobs at construction sites, in the hospitality sector or other service industries. But working in such high heat increases risks of dehydration, heat stroke and heart failure. While Gulf countries have banned working outside during the hottest part of the day, from noon till 4 p.m., many human rights groups say that's done little to prevent heat-related deaths. A recent study by Vital Signs Partnership says that as many as 10,000 migrant workers from South and Southeast Asia die in the Gulf every year and that more than one out of every two deaths is effectively unexplained. In reviewing the data, the report said that more than half the cases were recorded with no underlying cause of death, instead simply mentioning cardiac arrest, which only means the heart stopped beating. Thresiama Joseph says she believes if working conditions were better, her husband would still be alive. Isaac was under a lot of stress and he was keeping all of this to himself. If these things had happened on time and he had come back, this wouldn't have happened. That's what I think. Despite widespread criticism of migrant working conditions, notably in preparations for the World Cup in Qatar, the Gulf states have done little to enact structural labor reforms. Rights groups say more robust protections are needed for the 30 million migrants who work in the region. Well, for more, we can speak to our guest today, Nicholas McGeehan, Director of Fair Square Research and Projects. Thank you very much for joining us on Middle East Matters today. Thanks for having me. First of all, why are the Gulf states such dangerous places to work if you're a low-paid migrant worker? You're right, they're very dangerous places to work if you're a low-paid migrant worker. I mean, when you, you know, conditions are dangerous enough before the, the heat and the humidity arrives from the from the summer months. Um, you know, workers often work 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week. Um, often they're not paid properly. Often they're housed in very cramped, unsanitary, slum-like housing. Um, so it's already a very dangerous condition. And then when you add in the heat and the humidity, and remember, this is one of the hottest places in the world, um, then it really just adds uh, to the dangers for them. Um, you know, there are a whole host of other issues that are present, um, but the heat and humidity is certainly one of those issues that uh, makes them extremely vulnerable to bad health co- outcomes and also, unfortunately, to, to death. And you mentioned as well these um, heat-related illnesses. What are the kinds of illnesses and conditions we're seeing among these mostly healthy young men who make up the majority of the migrant workforce? 
Well, it's very hard to tell, actually. What you do know is that lots of young men, as you said, who are previously healthy, fall sick very quickly upon arriving in the Gulf. But because there aren't any investigations, because they don't really have proper access to health care, because medical records aren't adequately kept, it's very hard to draw firm conclusions as to how precisely they're dying. We know that heat's a problem. We know humidity's a problem. We know that hypertension, blood pressure is a problem. We know that stress, um, stress from being away from their families is a problem. And I think all of these factors combine to make it a very dangerous situation for them. But as you, you know, as I said earlier, the real problem, or one of the real problems is because we don't investigate the deaths and because the deaths aren't properly certified, it's very difficult to draw firm conclusions, any other conclusions other than it's extremely dangerous and we need to know a lot more about it. Now, as we head towards the World Cup in Qatar this November, would you say scrutiny has intensified over the conditions of these migrant workers, especially the ones building the stadiums? Absolutely. I mean, 10 years ago, nobody really knew about this issue. Nobody really knew much about Qatar, to be honest. Um, so now, because of the spotlight of the World Cup, there is a lot of discussion about it. There's um, Everyone recognises that there's a big problem. But what we haven't yet seen is we haven't seen the actions that we need to make sure that these workers are better protected and are safe from, you know, safe from negative health outcomes and are safe from, you know, dying needlessly. And, you know, the Qataris have have known about this problem for a very, very long time. They've just chosen to respond with public relations rather than with the laws um, and the investigations that we require. So why aren't there more protections in place uh, to protect these migrant workers? I think generally because they've not been under sufficient pressure to do so. Um, they've also been under a lot of pressure to finish this tournament, to get those stadiums ready and to get the infrastructure in place to make sure that things go well. Um, but ultimately, um, there have been two narratives present um, in the run-up to this World Cup. One, which says that everything is going well and the Catharines are doing super, you know, superbly well in all issues related to worker protection. I think that's a false narrative. I think when you look at the facts, um, then you know, workers are not being properly protected. But when you have these uh, dual narratives, when you have lots of influential groups and governments and other bodies saying that things are going well in Qatar, it's difficult to build up the pressure that you need to make the government uh, put the changes in place that are, that are required. And why aren't we seeing any pressure coming from the migrant workers' home nations? It's a very good question. I think largely because those nations tend to compete for this business. So India wants to send Indian workers, Bangladesh wants to send Bangladeshi workers, and Nepal wants to send Nepali workers. Um, they get a lot of money back in remittances um, that support their economies, and none of them want to jeopardise that. So none of them push particularly hard uh, to ensure protection for their nationals, who often come from the most vulnerable uh, segments of their own communities, of their own nations. Um, so, yeah, it's a real regrettable um, aspect of this that we don't we don't get that pressure from from origin states like we need. And uh, just finally, your, your report also touches on uh, the plight of female migrant workers who usually work as domestic helpers. What are the particular challenges that they face? Yeah, it's particularly harrowing cases of, of abuse, I think, for, for domestic workers. They tend to be shut in the homes of their employers. Um, they're very vulnerable to physical abuse and to sexual abuse and to psychological abuse as a result. Extremely difficult for them to get the health care that they need. And um, yeah, I think when you when you look at this issue, when you study this issue, it tends to be those cases of domestic workers and domestic worker abuse, um, which, which are the most upsetting and the most harrowing and the one where perhaps we need the greatest amount of detention. Nicholas McGee, and I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you very much for speaking to us here on Middle East Matters. Thank you. Well, moving on now, Jordan's Prime Minister has ordered an investigation into Monday's deadly blast at the Red Sea port of Aqaba. At least 13 people were killed and some 250 injured after a crane loading chlorine tanks onto a ship dropped one, causing an explosion of toxic yellow smoke. Prime Minister Bishar al Kazano said the gas concentration in the area had returned to normal and that most movement at the port had resumed. A United Nations investigation has found that Israeli forces fired the shot which killed Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. The Palestinian-American reporter was shot dead last month despite wearing a jacket marked press while covering a raid in Jenin in the occupied West Bank. The UN's findings contradict Israel's assertion that indiscriminate firing from Palestinians was to blame. Israel has branded the results of the probe as unfounded. 
Now, Palestinians in the Israeli blockaded Gaza Strip are rediscovering the pleasures of the Mediterranean after authorities declared the end of a long period of hazardous marine pollution. Tests now show the seawater is much cleaner thanks to a German-funded wastewater treatment plant that recently began operating in central Gaza. France 24's Nicholas Rushworth has this report. It is safe once again to go in for a summer dip. The quality of the water has improved significantly. This Gaza resident is back on her surfboard. I did not go swimming in the sea last year because of the pollution. This is the first time in almost two years. Marine pollution in recent years has been a health hazard with the wastewater of Gaza's 2.3 million inhabitants discharged directly into the ocean. However, authorities now say the sea is suitable again for swimming. This lifeguard has noticed the improvement. The sewage pumping has stopped, and the sea has become cleaner. The beach is the only place where people can go for a picnic, and where they can give their children a breath of fresh air. A recently opened German-funded plant operating in central Gaza is treating 60,000 cubic meters of wastewater per day. That is half of Gaza's sewage. Samples of seawater that have been tested indicate two out of three beaches are safe. The polluted part makes up 35 percent of beaches. Pollution is only concentrated in areas where the treated sewage is discharged from the treatment plants and partially treated in the gas strip plants. Authorities say they expect Gaza's beaches to be completely safe for swimming within two years once further treatment facilities are added. And finally, Israeli archaeologists have unveiled a rare ancient mosque in the country's south that sheds light on the region's transition from Christianity to Islam. The remains of the mosque in the Negev desert is believed to be more than 1,200 years old and originated from the 7th to 8th century AD. It was discovered during works to build a new neighborhood in the Bedouin city of Rahat. Now, three years ago, another mosque was unearthed nearby from the same era. These two Islamic places of worship are considered among the earliest known worldwide. Well, that's it from us uh, from Middle East Matters. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more world news here on France 24. France is famous for its beautiful sights and its delicious food, but it's also infamous for its aggressive drivers. Well, the French are the first to admit that it can be a bit wild on the roads out there, especially here in Paris. Speeding, road rage, drivers who tailgate you, insult you, give you the finger, it can be terrifying. And on top of all that, some of the road rules are downright confusing, and getting your license is an obstacle course. You cannot imagine how many people fail because of the right over to the right. La priorité à droite. La priorité à droite, exactly. In this French Connections Plus, we'll buckle up and merge into French driving. French Connections on France 24 and France24.com.